interesting story, Bay Bars. Um, my second book I wrote with a guy named Randy Commissar, who's a partner at Kleiner Perkins in California. And in writing that book, we came across a story of Costco, a big American retailer that uh, charges its customers to enter the store. So you're not allowed to shop in the store unless you pay in advance. You, you pay a membership fee. And we discovered that the membership fee that Costco charges its customers if you add up yours and mine and everybody else's, that comes to two thirds of operating profit every year. So they can bas basically run the retailing business at break even because they've already made their money on the membership fees. So I got curious about that model and I said, gee, I wonder if there are other ways we can get customers to fund the business. And I'd, I'd already been aware that if you look at league tables of fast growing companies like the Inc 5000 in the US or Fast Track 100 where I work in London, and you, you, you look at the fast growing companies, almost all of them never raised any venture capital, surprisingly, perhaps. So, so the question becomes, well, then where do they get the capital? Well, the answer is they get it from their customers. So I set out to learn, out, learn how that phenomenon happened. And I discovered there were five ways to do it. And that led to the book and, uh, and so on. So, um, so customer finance, uh, do you think customer finance is a smart finance like the finance provided by angel investors? Uh, well, yeah, it's, it's smart for many reasons. Number one, you don't have to give up any stake in your business. Uh, no, number two, it forces your focus onto the customer. And of course, if you serve the customer well, you're much more likely to have a successful business than, than if you don't do that. Um, it, and, uh, and, and three, it allows you to chart your own path. You know, we, we often talk about the value that investors bring to a business. Uh, and, and I myself and I'm, am an active in, angel investor and I've raised venture capital in my earlier life as an entrepreneur. So I know how that works, but I came across some really interesting data. I don't know if I can put this in front of my camera. There's a graph yeah. right here. We see it, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah that, that graph represents the, uh, the returns from every venture capital fund in the US from the beginning of the industry through 2011. And what you see in that graph is that the vast majority of venture capital funds deliver low single digit or negative returns uh, to their limited partners. And yet the people managing those funds think they're going to help the entrepreneur run their business. Well, that raised a pretty interesting question for me, right? Well, if they, if they can't figure out how to make money managing their business, how, how are they gonna help me run my business, uh, which I may know better, better than they do? So I think there's some fundamental problems in the traditional model. And uh, my books tries to open the, uh, open the window a bit and, and take a look. Yeah, I think, I think you are completely right. Uh, it seems the most valuable finance for entrepreneurs and startups uh, is customer finance because customer only wants the product and service they were promised to be given. That's all. They don't want interest. They don't want equity. They don't want, uh, I, uh, they only pay and buy. And this finance is very valuable if the entrepreneur of course knows how to use it in a correct way it is also uh, something of course in, yeah in, and, and one one of the things you find is if you try and try and get financing from your customers for example you ask them to pay in advance it's one of the five models if you ask like michael dell did right you had to pay mm -hmm. in advance to, to get michael dell's computer in the early days well uh, if the customer doesn't want to pay you in advance, that's maybe really useful information to have because maybe what you're trying to sell to them, they don't want to pay you for at all. Yeah. Uh, so, so these these models really help get you on on a useful track, and and of course once you get customer funding and you get some traction and you have customers coming back, and I'm talking real customers, not your cousin or your uncle. Uh, once you mm -hmm. establish traction, then I think you become very attractive to angel investors, potentially to VCs. So, so I don't argue that angel investing in VC is bad. I just argue, argue that there's a time and place for that investing, and it's not at uh, the moment of startup. But sometimes, um, I think number of customers 
who are ready to buy are also important to create a sustainable and profitable business. Uh, but Uber, for example, uh, Uber is losing money every year, but its company valuation is great. <laughs> How is that happening? So uh, the startup mindset and SME mindset, I mean, can we, can we uh, make such kind of, um, um, I mean, uh, separation between these two mindsets, startup mindset and SME mindset, because when you establish a company, a traditional business, a restaurant, let's uh, say, then of course, customer finance is very important. And uh, if it is profitable, then you go ahead. Uh, but in uh, millennium businesses, uh, which generally are uh, established by startups like Uber, then uh, the investor is not is not focusing on the profit side, but they are uh, 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 focusing on the company valuation side. And how is that happening? A company is losing money. Uh, customer finance. There is no customer finance, but it is very valuable. How is that happening? Well, actually, some of those companies did get started with customer funding, and a, a great example is Airbnb. You know, the two designers in San Francisco, where you are, JF. Uh, we're having trouble paying the rent and there was a big conference coming to town in the design industry and they said, well, there aren't enough hotel rooms. Why don't we get in touch with the bloggers and see if we can get a couple of people to sleep on our floor. We'll buy some air mattresses and we'll feed them breakfast and, and that became, you know, the name Airbnb. Well, that was customer funding to start that business and only later did they say, okay, now this, this is pretty easy to copy. So if we're going to win in this field we maybe need to put some fuel in the tank. And because we've already proven we can win customers, uh, then the likes of Paul Graham and others came in with capital and, and then it grew very fast. But at the outset, it was customer funded. Yeah, you, you, you mentioned about five models. What's that about? So there, there are five ways to do that is that, that I've discovered. One is called pay in advance where Michael Dell like Michael Dell did. You ask the customer to pay for the product or the service uh, before you deliver it. And of course, almost all service businesses are like that. You know, if you're going to uh, remodel your kitchen, you're going to pay the designer or something up front before she starts work. So pay in advance is one model and maybe the most straightforward. Matchmaker models or marketplace models, as some call them, like Airbnb and uh, Uber and eBay, just bring together buyers and sellers without the, the person owning that business ever touching the goods. O owner doesn't have, uh, Uber doesn't have any cars, Airbnb doesn't own any beds, but they bring together buyers and sellers as a matchmaker. And you can do that in the early days with customer funding. You can build a subscription model. So we all subscribe to stuff, right? Netflix mm -hmm. and the Wall Street Journal and all those things. When do we pay for the subscription? Well, we pay upfront. Okay, so we get the customer's money first. You can build a scarcity model. That's what Zara does. I su suspect most of the people on this call have a Zara store in their city. Uh, and Zara has trained its customers uh, that, the, that the merchandise offering is very scarce. And if you see something you like in Zara, you better buy it today because there isn't more of it coming tomorrow. And so the customer uh, buys that with cash or a credit card but Zara doesn't have to pay its suppliers for 60 days. So it's got the customer's cash for 60 days. And what does it do with that cash? Well, it can grow the business with that cash. So that's four. And then the, the fifth model is what I call service to product. So you start in a service business, uh, just as Bill Gates and Paul Allen did with Microsoft years ago. They were writing operating systems for all the big, all the nascent PC makers who needed an operating system system to make their their PC work. Uh, well, pretty soon Gates and Allen discovered all those operating systems look pretty much the same, and they said, "Why don't we just write one? We'll call it MS DOS. We'll put it in a nice, pretty shrink wrap box, or we'll download it, you know, with the computer, uh, and we'll turn our service, our customized service business, into a product business." And of course, that's when the value of Microsoft really took off. So these are the five ways to do it. And yeah. uh, that's, that, that's uh, what most entrepreneurs actually do. But as you said, Babars, there isn't much conversation about it. Yeah. Uh, um, unfortunately, John, 
today. Um, today's entrepreneurs are different than entrepreneurs of my time, at least. Um, for me, customer is the one who consumes my product or service and pays for it. This is my customer. But customer for today's entrepreneurs is sometimes the one who is going to invest in them. Angel investor is his customer, for example. <laughs> they are, they are the developing their business model in such a way that they only want to raise money from investors, not mm -hmm. from, from the customer in our uh, re regular, regular uh, terminology. And so, sometimes we see very sad examples of that. Uh, one of them being WeWork that comes to mind, right? Uh, we've all seen what's happened to WeWork now. It's in considerable trouble. It's, it's uh, yeah. you know, th yeah. that's probably what the motivation was there. Yeah. Um, do you think, do you think customer before COVID-19 and after COVID-19 will be different? Uh, we'll have different behaviors. Well, well, I think one of the things that COVID is doing to uh, the angel investing community is is causing us to be a little cautious. So, so we may see a deal that we think is pretty interesting that we're inclined to put some money into. I saw one a couple of weeks ago in London that I liked a lot. But, but we all know that in most startups that are angel and subsequently VC backed, there's going to be multiple rounds of capital that goes in. And I think one of the big risks we face as angels today is, yeah, we could put this round in, but will the company be able to raise another round given the difficult operating environment that, that we're in today? Uh, so that, that adds a lot of risk to angels. And I think uh, some of them are pulling back, waiting to see how things play out. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What about, what about crowdfunding? I, uh, do, you, do, do you think yeah. crowdfunding will be more important after, after COVID? Because it is an online tool, as a matter of fact. Uh, wh what do you think about it? Yeah, so, so I, I devote a portion of a chapter in, in the book to, to Kickstarter and, and how it works. And uh, there are a couple of surprises as I really dug into Kickstarter and how it works that some people don't understand. Uh, one of the big ones is you have to bring your own crowd. So the, so the way you get a Kickstarter campaign to be successful is you, you, know, you, you build a great prototype and a good video and all that stuff. And then you line up at least a third of the money that you're gonna need uh, before you launch the Kickstarter campaign. And then you tell your uncle to go on Monday and your cousin goes on Tuesday and, and you develop some momentum. And if you can build some momentum, then the crowd comes along. That's kind of how the successful campaigns work in, in Kickstarter. Will there be more of that going forward? I think there probably will, as you suggest, but it's not as trivi trivial a game to play as, uh, as it mm -hmm. seems on the surface. Yeah. Uh, do, you, do you think, do you think uh, customer finance will still be available after COVID-19? Uh, absolutely it, it will. Mm, okay. Absolutely it will because, because customers will still have problems to solve. And, and what we do best, we entrepreneurs and, and we angels who back entrepreneurs, what we do best is solve customer problems. So when I, when I talk to my students at London Business School who say, well, I wanna be an entrepreneur, but I don't have an idea. I say, don't worry about having an idea. Find a problem that some customer has. It's a compelling problem for which your skills uh, and interests are well suited and see if you can solve that problem. And if you can solve that problem, COVID or not, somebody will pay you to do so. And in fact, many very uh, successful companies have been started in the depths of really difficult economic envi environments. Hewlett Packard started in the depression. Twilio and uh, Birchbox started in the financial crisis of 2008, 2009. Th th those are all incredibly successful companies that were able to get their start in a tough environment because they found problems to solve and, and figured out ways to solve them. So absolutely. Governments, governments in that case should support customers or should support companies, entrepreneurs directly. Which one is better according to you? I, I, I'm not sure that governments should do either to be really honest with you. I, I think we're 
where government support can be most effective is to help an entrepreneur who's already got some customer funding and got some customer traction and proving proven it can work, uh, where, where government programs can really help then is to help that nascent company grow faster. We know that virtually all of the job creation around the world, the developed countries and undeveloped countries uh, comes from fast growing entrepreneurial ventures. It doesn't come from startups because for every startup that's starting today, there's another one that's failing today. Uh, so the jobs are created by fast growing companies. And uh, I think the research evidence suggests that the best use of government funds is to help things that have gotten started and, and are showing promise to grow mm -hmm. faster. Yeah. Uh, as a, as a um, uh, personal investor, you are, you are an academician, you are an entrepreneur, you are an investor, you have different hats. But yep. while uh, John Mullins uh, invests in a startup, do you like to invest in the jockey or the horse? Which one is important for you? Uh, it's not, not quite that simple. Uh, I, I guess what I tell entrepreneurs I meet, early stage entrepreneurs, is what I like to invest in is not dots, moments and times, but I, I like to invest in lines. So if I meet you today and, and uh, I like the, what you're doing, I say, so what's going to happen in the next 30 days or what happened has to happen in the next 60 or 90 days. And let's come back and touch base. And if I see a bunch of dots where progress is happening and eventually there are customers and then there's some more customers, then I have some comfort that that's a, a business that's going to go somewhere. And, and then potentially I back that business, but, but uh, that's not as simple as, as saying it's a jockey or a horse. It's, a, it's about proving progress in the marketplace that there's a problem being solved here and the customers are happy to open their wallets uh, for the guy who's solving it. Yeah, thank you. John, thanks so much. You're and, welcome, Baybars. And what is your, what is your uh, direct message to all entrepreneurs? Okay, they are going to find the problem and then... Uh, to, to entrepreneurs, I always say, find a problem that you can fix. If, if you can't find a problem, nobody's going to pay you to solve a non-problem. Vinod Kosala said that many years ago, a well-established uh, investor in, in Silicon Valley. Uh, find a problem to solve, figure out how to solve it, build a complete team that brings together all the pieces you need to solve that problem, uh, and then get started. Thank you. Thank you very much, John. Thank so you. Much. Now I am coming to our roundtable uh, speakers. We have two great speakers today in the roundtable. Matthew Jemser re is representing SME, small and medium-sized uh, enterprises part, and JF is representing the startups in this roundtable. Because startups and SMEs, now we will try to understand if these uh, two important players of economies are uh, uh, same entrepreneurs or they are different entrepreneurs and if their needs are same or not. Uh, Matthew Jemser is the CEO of SME Finance Forum uh, operated by the World Bank uh, Group's IFC and uh, he is uh, also a global speaker traveled uh, the, 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 whenever I uh, <laughs> visit uh, LinkedIn, I see him, he is uh, somewhere in the world. So uh, he is collecting good information about uh, the global entrepreneurial ecosystem. And JF uh, is the founder and CEO of Startup Genome. And Startup Genome, uh, as you know, uh, is the most uh, respected uh, data uh, source uh, for governments, especially on a startup economy and on uh, entrepreneurship. So uh, let me start from JF, uh, Matt, because uh, startups and SMEs, let's first uh, clarify the difference between these two words. Because sometimes uh, while we speak, while we write, we say entrepreneur, sometimes we say an, uh, startup, sometimes we say SME. What are the differences? JF, what are the differences according to you? Voice. Thank you. Yes. 
Thank you, Bebar. It's great to be here. Uh, and these are important topics right now, right? Because the entrepreneurs are those that create new firms. And as we saw from all the research, Kaufman Foundation leading is that new firms create 100% of net new jobs in these days. As corporations are trying to be more and more effective, increase productivity on labor, and actually over time reduce the number of employees. So therefore, they're our economic recovery. So entrepreneurship is at large, right? Those, those people who say, who are not afraid, are resilient, and say, I want to create something new. I want to create a job for myself, but a job for many other people. And then among those entrepreneurs, some are, you know, traditional entrepreneurs, you know, restaurants or dry cleaners, all kinds of businesses. And you have the technology enabled entrepreneurs, right? the web based entrepreneurs. And some of them are not necessarily very innovative. And some are extremely innovative. And these are the ones that, as, as, as uh, your previous speaker was saying, like the, it, the fastest growing tech companies create 80% of those new jobs. Yeah. So when we're talking about entrepreneurship, there's the general entrepreneurship, there's some tech enabled, and there's the high power. High, highly scalable businesses. And Steve, we always work with Steve Blank's definition, right? The startup's a temporary organization designed to search for a scalable and repeatable business model. That means if they don't scale, they should die. Right? We're putting money and energy from an ecosystem for a startup community to help them because we believe that one out of 10 of them might create 10,000 jobs, 50,000 jobs. Yeah. And that's the difference really between the other ones where you have an enormous number of new jobs, but a few amount number of employees per biz, per, per new businesses. Uh, JF, what is the uh, company valuation? Uh, maybe you don't know, but if you know it, please uh, say it. But I think it is around, if I'm not wrong, um, three or four billion dollars. Uh, Airbnb. What is the company valuation of uh, Airbnb? I have no idea uh, right now. But it's, Let's it's say three or four billion dollars. dollars. This is what I do. Yeah. We can Google and yeah. uh, check. I think you're probably uh, right. You are you are representing Airbnb mindset here, and Matthew is representing Hilton hotels, because Hilton <laughs> hotels <laughs> is not so valuable. Matthew Hilton <laughs> hotels is hundred years old. More people are working in Hilton hotels. They spend hundred years. But maybe it is only one billion, one billion dollar. Airbnb only recruits thirty people at its office, and it is three billion dollars. So this is the difference between startups and SMEs. Uh, I think uh, in, uh, what John in his uh, speech gave a very good example uh, and reminded this Airbnb uh, issue. Uh, uh, Matthew, uh, small and medium enterprises, sized enterprises, are still representing 97% of the world economy. So you don't need to be upset about uh, the Hilton uh, uh, sample. <laughs> still SMEs are kings. Uh, we don't have- oh, I, I'm not upset, Babars, but I, I, I mean, uh, most people would not call Hilton an, an SME, but- uh... They'd call it a corporation, but um, but leaving that okay. aside, uh, and you have to be careful with all this because yes, SMEs represent, and I'm usually arguing the other side of this, but SMEs do represent a lot of the economy in many countries, but the richer the country, the less the share of the economy they represent. And large companies still provide, uh, uh, you know, they provide half the jobs in the United yeah. States where I'm yeah. sitting, yeah, right? right? So, yeah. and, and so you got to be careful when you're, you're, because policymakers can take this the wrong way and, and say, whoa, you know, uh, you're, you're telling me I should abandon the Hiltons who are providing millions of jobs and, and th do all my policy thinking about how to help the, the Airbnbs. Well, then, then I end up helping the WeWorks and all they do is steal their investors' money. I mean, you know, it, it, we have to be very careful here. But yes, I believe in SMEs. I've just argued the opposite side of the fence that I'm usually arguing. But I, at, the, at the end of the day, you know, and I'm also, uh, I'd like to think I'm an entrepreneur because I'm running an independent enterprise from within the IFC. And we've been running it for four years and we have customers. But I don't think just because I'm not starting, I'm not a, an entrepreneur. Um, 
you know, nor that if we get to a stable phase where we we don't have to grow at exponential rates to to get to break even. You know, we we're also not entrepreneurs after that point. Uh, entrepreneurialism is that I'm 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 my own boss and I decide and I'm running the company. Um, I mean, maybe yes. Once I get lots of investors from other places and I'm working for them, then I'm not an entrepreneur anymore. But there's a long a long distance in the life cycle when I'm still an entrepreneur that goes well beyond startup, at least to me, even though I would say we're still a startup four years old, right? So. Okay. Yeah, and, um, and obviously a lot of the jobs are created by the large companies and are still there, right? So yes. of course, as yes. the government acts, they need to pay attention to the whole portfolio of, of the economy, all of the job creators. Um, yeah. But right That's now when I look, when I look at the, the, what we've seen in, in the research, right? It's really interesting to, to put it in, in charts. And Kauffman Foundation, they did our Nobio works with us now, created this chart, which you see the red, the red zone. These are the large companies, the old companies, and they're, how much jobs they let go during a recession is larger than the jobs they create outside of the recession. And so all of these jobs created are, are you know, created by what Matthew does and what by what our customers does, right, Matthew, with the ESMEs and the startups. These are the, this is this red line that is resilient. Yeah, and this Entrepreneurs is, continue to create jobs even during a recession. Completely agree. And this is the space I'm more comfortable in arguing that side of it because um, I've been on some panels recently uh, with the World Economic Forum and others where you've got some people, including some pretty, um, you know, well-credentialed macroeconomists, let me, without revealing names, because it's kind of Chatham House rules, and, and they make arguments that, well, you know, so many SMEs fail, so therefore the lesson in this COVID-19 crisis is that the government should not be providing any support for SMEs, because a lot of them fail. And I can tell you, there's some, uh, you, you can take some of the, my, the people I admire in the alternative lending industry, say, in Europe or the United States, and some of them went to some of these universities whose professors still argue for this sort of nonsense. And they'll tell you now that they're in the real world, it doesn't work that way. There are, there are plenty of enterprises that are the smaller enterprises, the ones that show the resiliency that bounce back faster, that can make the adaptations. They, they forget that Kaufman curve conveniently because, you know, I mean, you're sitting in a university and you're getting your research funding from large corporations. You're not getting it from the SME community. So you, you don't get this other perspective, unfortunately, often enough. And, and the other thing is that we, we shouldn't dismiss the SME that's only going to grow a little because that's the vast majority of SMEs. And if we can help, government should also be thinking about how can I help them recover now? Because if I let them, more of them go out of business than is necessary, it's going to cost me more than just, you know, X to get them back. It's going to, if X was the original cost, it's going to cost me X plus, uh, you know, so the, the, helping them avoid that going into insolvency or wind up or whatever the country regime is going to be really important right now. And, and encouraging um, dialogue with, with their, um, with their in, investors, with their, the people they owe with, you know, doing things like, for example, encouraging the large companies that have, you know, 15, 20 trillion dollars that they owe to SMEs worldwide right now. And, and, and we're sitting on rich treasuries, rich corporate treasuries, which have almost no high yielding options in the things that they normally do, like government securities and other safe bets. Why don't they just pay the SMEs early? You know, these are the sort of things that governments should be thinking about now. Uh, about how to how to help because that would stabilize the SMEs who, as we heard from John, they've they've got a market. They have a history of working, supplying big companies, or even as distributors for big companies as regular. They should be able to pay later, you know, with the same companies offering them financing to have extended payments and keep in business. Because yes, not many of those companies become real fast growers that we hear about. They're not the typical path of a unicorn. But they add a few jobs each. Collectively, that makes a lot of jobs in the world. And we advise, you know, governments on, on startup financing and how to help the ecosystem survive. 
and I, I know all the other angel investors, I, I'm an angel investor as well, really care about saving the startups. But also, you know, all of the governments we advise are working on first on SME. This is the majority of jobs, as Matthew said. It's also jobs that are not easy and people who are not easy to replace in the new jobs if they lose their job, right? The techies yeah. is different, right? They, they have the jobs of the future, but your 40, 50, 60 year old people who've been working in traditional economy, don't let these businesses die because you're gonna have high unemployment and it's gonna be very hard to replace. Uh, yeah, I like Uber. I like Lyft. I like Airbnb, but I don't think it's a good policy to say, let's just let everybody become independent gig workers serving those platforms. I think that would be a very dangerous solution for a country. Very dangerous. Uh, um, JF, um, Matthew is able to announce that 97% of the world economy is driven by SMEs because OECD has such kind of surveys, research. According yeah. to you, uh, what is the percentage of startups uh, taking role in the economies? How much percent of economies are driven by startups? Yeah, so it's, it's an interesting question because of course, when you talk about startups, you talk about the new ones and once the exit, oftentimes you say, this is a large mm -hmm. corporation, that's a tech corporation. So we take them out. But the way we look at it is that there's, there's this new revolution of creating new businesses and tech-enabled businesses. And that, what we call the global startup revolution. So these startups are created from a community of CFOs are really investors, the angel investors, the VCs, a community of mentors and HR people are really the accelerators, the incubators, right? The new corporation is the community of startups of the startup ecosystem. And that community has created businesses and large businesses at a unseen rate in the past. Right? Where a business now, when we look at the, the average age of companies on the S&P, it used to be 25 years ago, only 20 years, 25 years ago. And now it's less than 10 years old. That means most of the businesses in S&P are new businesses that grew so fast. And those, this, that global startup revolution has created companies that now represent about 4%, 5% of the global economy. And when we measure its value in the last, you know, now we've quantified it precisely over the last five years, it grows about 10% a year, which is about three to four times, five times the rate of our economy, right? So mm -hmm. this, is, this is the sector of the future. Within 20, 30 years, it's gonna be the number one engine of the economy, but it's not right now. So of course, first, save your SMEs, help your corporation, yes. But now after that, save the engine of growth, that is the growth of your future to, to create jobs for our children, our children's children. And, and if we think about the angel community that makes up a lot of the people on this call, I expect, um, one of the things I like most about angels is that, look, the venture capitalists, it's very clear. I'm going to make 10 deals and nine of them are going to fail. And the 10th one is going to have to pay for everybody. Right. And that means it has to grow enormously. Right. You need the one of your companies has to hockey stick. But angels are not so uniform and angels often are 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 looking for doing something that will create some good businesses that are providing real services for customers that are going to grow steadily and are going to make a return. But that, you know, an angel that's trying to say, I'm going to go for 10 firms and hope that one survives is not an angel, right? I mean, uh, uh, and, and, um, and, and in that sense, we need to be encouraging both types of companies because unfortunately the tech companies are not very labor intensive and we need jobs in this world because in order to have consumers, people need to have incomes from somewhere. And I refuse to believe that we're all going to be gig workers. I want to come back to that point. I think we do need companies providing essential goods and services, um, and they're not all going to be giant. You know, just like in the most of the world today, the one thing that isn't going to change is that a lot of our critical goods and services are going to come from small businesses that, that are always going to be small business sourced. Um, I, and, I, and, I, and I think that's why we need angels, because they can help both the the businesses that have long-term, you know, the techie businesses that have long-term high potential, but they can also help these other businesses that are perfectly good, that, that will grow, 
that will give a good return and good livelihoods. But the angel, many angels will be happy knowing that they support that, that sector. And, and, um, and, and if we don't have that, we're in trouble because, uh, you know, I don't think we can rely. I think we're relying less and less, unfortunately, on the banks to support any of this. The banks were never good with the rocket growth startups. They're never going to be. Everybody knows that. But they're also, they've also never really been comfortable with normal SMEs. And, and today, with all the Basel reforms from the last crisis, with all the difficulties right now of doing risk management for firms that they never understood before with all these unprecedented factors, you got to expect less and less of banks. And look, look what's happened in some of the highly publicized rescue programs. You know, here in the U.S., we have the scandals about the money went to listed companies that, you know, that really aren't small businesses. And, you know, that's not and some of them gave it back, but it's not good that it happened uh, in the U.K., you're, you know, you're finding that you're only getting a, a short, a short slice of the SME community that's getting the well-intentioned emergency support programs. And the same is true in emerging markets. The rest are not, are not helped. And it's because the banks who are the conduit that the governments tend to work through and who are most of my members. So, but, you know, they know that we're talking about this. Most of them have not geared up to be able to do this in the timely manner with the right sort of responsible selection. So it's putting greater and greater premium on alternative sources. And I would highlight people like angels to play very important roles because just because times are bad, as everybody said, doesn't mean they aren't times of opportunity. And they're not just opportunity for unicorn style growth. They're also good opportunities for versatile versatile small businesses who will do what they're doing, but find a different way to do it in the crisis. Look at the restaurants that have geared up to do home delivery more. Look at the, you know, look at people that have retooled their small scale manufacturing to make PEP equipment or other essential goods. Now, um, you know, this is, this is, these are not unicorns. These are not going to be people we talk about in the same breath as Mark Zuckerberg and, you know, and Bill Gates and, and Jack Ma, but they're, they're just as resilient, just as valuable, but they need, they need angels because, they, you know, in, in most of those cases, if they went to the banks, they didn't get a response that they wanted. They're just doing it. Yeah, I like what you're saying about you. And, you know, I like also to get out of like, this is the SMEs or the tech companies or the large companies, or, you know, it's better to finance startups that do customer financing instead of not customer financing. And I, I don't believe that. I think, you know, all of these parts are important, right? Some of those businesses, uh, as John said, are, are started with customer financing and some didn't, it did very well. And obviously Google didn't start with, with customer financing and did extremely well. Uh, you know, Alibaba, all of these companies, Amazon, you know, they, they needed financing. And then there's the SMEs that, that, are very different, but also need needs to be to be saved. What Matthew was saying about it's a good time to invest. You know, when we looked at that recently, and you t you say we're the data people, and we're really data driven. We always look at those things. We we studied what happened to to the Series A invested in 2008 during the Great Great Recession and Q1 of 2009. And when we look at the multiple of exit versus capital rate, it's actually a little bit higher. When we look at the return on vintage of VC portfolio, you can see that the returns on 2008 startup series A or plus is actually higher than two, three years before, right? And even the lower quartile of VCs was higher. So it's, it's, it's a good time to invest still. And what, we, what I know, I, I got finance, I got a series A in 2009 in March and we're still growing. Right? because we're resilient, because we adapted our business model very rapidly to the new recession. And we used to be growing at 25% a month. And then during the recession, we grow 15% a month. Right? We still did very well. So there is still you know, a lot of great startups to invest in. Uh, and and uh, you know, the, the, the historical return shows that you know, this is a good time. I think, I think uh, business, business model uh, will define what like an entrepreneur this guy is. He will he is an SME or he will be an SME or he will be a startup business model. Uh, what I mean is this is a handkerchief. I want to sell handkerchief 
and make money. This is my business model. That's all in my to-do list. So I can, I, can, I think I am, I am a uh, potential uh, traditional business owner. This is, but if I am focusing on selling the factory to uh, that I established to sell this handkerchief, handkerchief factory in the future. So if I am trying to kill two birds with one stone, selling handkerchief, making money, and in the future making an exit and selling my factory uh, to another uh, the, the, the group. If this is my business model, if I am focusing on also selling the whole business I create, then this is a little bit different than traditional business ownership, I think. This is a little bit uh, relative with startup uh, ecosystem. Uh, exit, if exit, making exit is in my business model from the first minute of establishing the company, then I have a startup mindset. But if I am dreaming to have my daughters and sons also run my, the business I establish now in the future, that is a traditional uh, business uh, mindset. And I am aiming to become one of the SMEs of uh, economy. Now, you can so are you suggesting, you know, are, when we, please criticize when we, yeah. my, my statements now. Matt, uh, what do you think about well, this? Uh, well, statement? I was going to ask you, I was going to ask you a question back, Baybar. So are you suggesting that angels should not be interested in, in, a, in a pitch from somebody that says, I want to build SME something industry, that's yeah. going to be around for my children to run it? Um, I mean, that would but, seem like a, a kind of extreme okay. point of view to me. Okay, I am uh, going to give you an answer with a question. Do you think, do you think the guy who approached McDonald's and converted the system to a McDonald's franchise chain is an angel investor? Do you think he's an angel investor? Do I think that Roy Kroc is an, was an angel investor? Um, yeah. Uh, yeah, because he wanted to back them and help them grow. Yes, yes, and, he was angel and he liked what they did. Because what yeah, and he I think did it's was, about, yeah, it's about whether you get one, you're going to get your returns and your money back from dividends, royalties, or an exit, and it's fine. It's and it's Fifty Shades of Grey, right? It's not. I don't agree with the. If you want, you're going for an exit. You're a, you're a tech company. You know, one of my friends at Singularity Institute started inviting those entrepreneurs and started asking them. So it was really 101. It's like, so you know that if you go to VC financing, you have to sell your company. You have to give it up. Mm -hmm. And nine out of 10 said, no, I want to build to last. I want to keep my company forever, right? So this is a mentality. And a lot of the problem that we see in startup financing is that the model that was very successful in Silicon Valley created for these high-tech semiconductor companies that by yeah. definition could yeah. not do customer financing because they had to build a billion dollar plan first, right? And all of the technology of VC financing was created around these heavy technology investments. And as we're in software, the investment went down, went down, and now you can do customer financing even in software. But these technologies of VC, financing has become, we think, the standard and a lot of time the only way, but it's not true. Right? You can do angel financing with what we call an alternative term sheet, which is revenue-based, the old way. Right? Once you get to enough revenue, give me 2% back every year until you repaid with a return, 3% back. And so this is still a tech company, right? maybe with a lower potential for exit or not a desire to exit. And we believe that this is the majority of what what the right technology, the right methodology should be outside of the big tech startup ecosystem because most of the entrepreneurs in Africa and Middle East and in even in Europe, outside of the big, big tech centers, should be doing, you know, revenue based financing. So the angels can get their money back and reinvest another one and with a profit, as opposed to waiting for this elusive exit that oftentimes the tech entrepreneurs doesn't really want to go towards. Yeah. But in Silicon Valley, we force them. We have a VC, we do Series A. By Series B, the VC has controlled, 
and say, no, you need to exit. You need to exit. I'm closing my portfolio <laughs> within yeah. seven years. You need to exit. You need to give my money back. And now I have power. I'm on the board. I have majority yeah, and, board seat. <laughs> and and you, when we saw from your, your figures, JF, that, you know, and I, I used to keep the figures for the European Venture Capital Association before I... Uh, before I joined IFC. So that's all right. I'm 20 years out of date with what the numbers or well, from 2005 with what the numbers suggest, but it was exactly the things you showed that the fourth quartile of VCs doesn't make squat anyway. In fact, they make, they in, in a, and, and guess what? Neither do the second or the third. There's a huge gap between the returns from the first quartile and, and the lower three. And, and, and so this now myth that, that rates are so low, you know, this is the right yeah. model for everybody. I'm just saying the myth that this is the right model for everybody. I do. I'm just trying to strongly discourage saying that's the way that angels should be thinking. The good thing about angels is they don't approach it in the same way, whether it's because of the type of self-liquidating investment you described or other aspects of the way angels work. And it's why it's been so hard to do VC type funding in emerging markets and why it's so limited and why the, the few that are trying to do it differently, look at say growth in or business partners in Africa or, or somebody like funding societies in Southeast Asia, people that are trying to do this differently, it's, it's hard because everybody's saying, well, why aren't you doing it like VC? Why, you know, VC makes yeah. tons of money. Well, the fact is it works, makes tons of money in a very specific environment with a very specific type of company. And that company alone doesn't make an economy. And so, you know, trying to tilt everything about policy to creating a Silicon Valley style VC industry is not a good idea. And, and countries kind of drank the Kool-Aid, too many of them. And they're, they're tilting also, everything that way. And you know, there's more than just the capital that the angels provide. So we're trying to also to change that mindset. First, you should not adopt just the technology of VC financing of Silicon Valley everywhere and to force it on every deal. But secondly, when you talk about the banks not being very good at SME financing, right? and I've been retracted over the years, I remember when I started my career, we're doing SME financing guaranteed by the government in Canada. And we did a bunch of it, and that, that was actually a very good impact. But since then, the banks have gone into you know, deals. Right? I get a percentage of a deal that have no risk. So they retracted a lot. But the other thing that they can, they've never been good at is advising. Right? Where the angels are high net worth individuals that had their own business or were an executive, made money, and bring mentorship plus capital. And that's why... Right? The business that succeeds usually starts with an angel investing in them because they get the tough love, they get the good advice, they got the introductions to customers. Uh, they usually get 10 investors, 20 investors, and therefore a range of access of networks that they can use for customers, employees, et cetera, suppliers, deals. And so that's why this is very important that the banks are not as good and will never be as good as the angel community and why the angels are so important. But then the angels need to understand that, you know, the, the, the Silicon Valley develop uh, startup financing is not, doesn't fit everything. So Yeah, I mean, if I look at... It's not the truth everywhere, in SMEs, but also in tech. I mean, look at the segment of SMEs that have, that are young, but they've succeeded in acquiring one prestigious buyer for whatever it is they do, whatever good or service. Um, this is an, I, a terrible situation for bankers because I guarantee you, in, in most cases, that entrepreneur goes to the banker and says, look, I've got all these orders from the, my main client and I need, I need credit. And the banker looks at and they say, look, I'm looking at your balance sheet and you're just way too leveraged, right? And so it, it can't work for me, and, 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 but unless you tell me about your personal assets, and, or, or, or the business assets and the, and, and the guy, the guy, the entrepreneur, he, she rightly doesn't want to get into the personal assets because they have greater ambitions for this thing to grow. And secondly, they don't want to, they don't have any business assets. They're probably leasing their space. They may be leasing their, any equipment they're using. So the banker can't make it work, but it's a great deal. Now there are only two people that can, one is maybe that buyer is going to help them out a bit, but those corporations, they're, they're fickle, right? And, and if you're depending on them, you know, they say, well, what's in it for my quarterly earnings report next, you know, next quarter? And, and sometimes helping you is not in that equation. The other, but what about an angel? The angel can not only do as, he can not only say, I, I come in, I have some capital, I can advance you something. 
I can advance it on different terms than the bank would anyway. I'm not worrying about the regulator telling me what's, what's this doing to your risk weighting at, risk weighted assets. I also probably know something about your business and your buyer. And I can say, I'm not only going to help you for this, but I'm going to introduce you to 10 other buyers in that sector because you could really take this even bigger. You know, this is, this is not a Silicon Valley style situation, but it's a perfect situation for an angel where you could create a lot of jobs. I mean, maybe not thousands. It may not be a unicorn, but it still could be very valuable for whatever country it's in. And we've got yeah, to make sure right. that we don't, you know, we tell the full story about why, what angels can do that's valuable. And that's why entrepreneurial finance has to start with, with angels. And when, when we show in tech, we're trying to show like, that the, it's not a problem of capital when there's early stage problem. It's actually in an ecosystem, it's actually an angel problem usually. And when we look at the rate of seed funded startups as a percentage of all startups in a city versus the rate of exits, you can see how dramatically correlated it is. Incredi incredibly correlated. So we've looked at you know, more than 100 cities. That's about 75 here. Uh, so, and it's because it's not the government giving a grant. That doesn't work, right? It's a angel community saying, we're going to bring capital and we're going to bring advice. And in assessing the opportunity, we also brought a lot of expertise and knowledge. Yeah. Um, That's a really good point. Some, uh, some years ago, I was, I was interviewed by CNN International's Question Means Business uh, program. The, 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 uh, in DC studios met. Uh, and the question was, what is the difference between American entrepreneurs and Middle East entrepreneurs? That was the question. You can Google and find this. It is, it is on uh, YouTube, uh, by the way, this, <laughs> this interview. I, I said, I, 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 I gave an answer. McDonald's is an entrepreneur who says he has 5,000 branch offices all over the world, and he's proud of this. But in Middle East, you will see many restaurants who will write to their uh, doors, they have only one branch office, and it is this. They don't have any branch office anywhere, anywhere in the world, and this entrepreneur is also proud of this. One of them says 5,000 branch, the other one, only one branch office, and he is proud of this. Unfortunately, unfortunately, for example, in Istanbul, uh, on the main um, uh, street, Istiklal uh, Street, there was a there was 125 years old small restaurant. I visited this guy many times, and I said. Why don't you franchise your business? Because the whole Turkey, Inji, Inji Pastan, everybody knows your brand. You are here and your grandfather established this uh, restaurant. Now uh, you are running it and you are, you are still have one branch office and all Turkey knows it is great, your products. He says, no. And what happened when he visited the banks he couldn't get loan in the financial crisis in uh, uh, 2008, and it is closed now because he couldn't. Yes, but Baybars, convert... be careful because because you can tell the same story about the one that decided to expand. We have a in the Washington D.C. area. We have a company called Heckinger's, and it's not much of a company anymore. But it started with a couple of stores, and for Washington, it was particularly important because it was one of the first stores that really gave inner city kids who didn't have much education a chance. And yet it was making a ton of money. And it was certainly the place 30, 40 years ago where I would have gone for all my hardware and things like that. And then, and they had one store and then they had two stores and then they had three. But then somebody said, well, you can, you're not serious unless you're competing with do it all from the UK or Lowe's from the U S or home Depot from the U S. So, Young John Heckinger, the son of the founder, who was also John Heckinger, said, okay, I can't beat him, I gotta join him. And he immediately did this massive expansion and got crushed. And so we have now crappier stores with less customer attention. And the, those kids in the inner city have to go way out to the suburbs to get the same sort of jobs that existed in the city. So 
you know, I'm not convinced that that there's one magic formula and it's it's yeah. you know, you gotta yeah. wanna be a massive franchise yeah. or you can't succeed. I mean, yes, in my in my where I grew but up maybe, maybe in the Washington DC area, they're that, only yeah, yeah. yeah but, sorry, but, I don't uh, mean to I monopolize this. Yes, but but yeah, I, I didn't but tell you right. that I mean, the again, magical formula again, was franchise. I want to say, again, it's I want not to a, say a, a, yeah. this or that, right? There's a range of different, yes, and yes. it's cultural, right? When I worked in yes. the advising the law industry in the UK, it was all partners, they're all the yeah. same, they all have the same power. And the US was a little bit of eat what you kill, the rainmakers were bigger, but, and then in the Italy, it was, you know, the Tsar, one person yeah. who was the king, and when the person dies, the firm died. Yeah. And, you know, but when you look about tech, what's happening is that if you want to grow, you also have to leave control to others if you want to grow that fast. Yeah. And that's a mentality. That's a culture. You know, when we look at what is the mentality, the mindset of a real big tech entrepreneurs, they don't like, they don't need control. And that's the other mindset of the, no, I grow mm -hmm. myself and around me versus I just want to do something big and I don't think, I don't care about losing control. Yes, I'll give 25% to VC in first round and another, and then I'll lose control and may, they may fire me, but I'm creating a huge impact on the world. And impact is not social impact, yeah. obviously, but that's the, that's the mm -hmm. mindset of those entrepreneurs that say, yeah, I'm just going to grow and maybe in three years I'll, I'll be fired and I'll do, another, I'll do another one. But, you know, Zuckerberg kept the company as CEO, but he has very little power versus what he had in the past. He had to give up a lot of powers to be able to grow so quickly. And that's really a difference between, you know, when we invest in teams at the angel level, it's like, okay, what is driving you? What do you want to do? You want to create something big and you don't care about losing control or you care about control. You want to think something that you'll keep forever. And that already tells you a lot about, right? Is it the VC model or is it the revenue-based term sheet? Yeah, and and the positive thing about about America is even in the bad case where the the Heckingers fails, the Heckingers can show up on the street in Washington D.C. and everybody still admires them. Why? Because in America, you tried and failed, you're you're still a hero, right? Because everybody says, "I wish I could do that too." I like their gumption. In, in Europe, in the Middle East, uh uh, you know, you failure is a huge deal, and and that, this is one of the main things that's handicapping. Both, on, both, both entrepreneurs and angels that, you know, it shouldn't be. We should, we should have, you know, admire the people. And, and I guess maybe it's because we're more of a younger frontier country in America that actually, we have more of that culture. Actually, actually we see that uh, research has shown that it's not a country issue. It's really a city issue. When through experience, we see that failed entrepreneurs do a bit big in, you know, in London, in Berlin now. Right, the mentality mm -hmm. of the city and the angels change, and the VCs and all the employees, everybody around them changes when we see through experience that it works. And in early stage ecosystem, it's not happening. But I wanted to know, to know, to to want to switch Baybars to also talk about policy because this is an important time right now where these SMEs and these tech startups are at risk of dying and having a real extinction of a lot of them, and. I want, I'd love to talk about policy if we have time before we end. Yeah, of course. Uh, but let me complete my sentences and uh, <laughs> Sorry. Please, Matt, don't, don't jump in, in the middle of my sentence. And uh, I want to complete <laughs> it. Uh, I, I want to say uh, entrepreneurs should develop their own way of raising funds to develop their businesses to scale up. Uh, or just a second, my. Yeah. Uh, if you visit a bank, the bank will never tell you, uh, "Hey, why don't you franchise your business and get franchise fees and uh, um, uh, finance your business?" They will not tell you. So mentorship and education; these two keywords are very important for entrepreneurs. If we expect from all every entrepreneur that they can find their own way, yes, they can do it, of course, but they learn it in 50 years, 100 years, 30 years, or tomorrow morning. So education and mentorship are closing this gap. So this is what I mean. If he's an SME or a startup or uh, what, at the end of the day, he has a business idea wants to convert this business idea to cash 
to business, create new jobs, new wealth, which will also serve to more social justice in the world. He's making something good. Let's help these entrepreneurs. And we and entrepreneurs shouldn't expect everything from governments or from banks, from VCs, from angel investors. They should also focus on developing innovative ways of financing their businesses. Thank you very much, Matt, for not uh, <laughs> joining me in this statement. <laughs> and now uh, policymakers, um, I think it is very important because in such kind of COVID-19 case, for example, we understood that policymakers uh, are playing a, a crucial role to, to keep the sustainability of economies and of uh, the businesses. What do you think, uh, Jaya? Yeah, it's extremely important. Right now we see a big risk, as always, that in a recession that VCs retract. But they retract right now in COVID a lot more than usual. And I'll show you a chart that captures that. Uh, and, you know, we looked at China because they're ahead of us. Uh, but it's happening right now. We see in London and in the, U in the U.S. where the red line shows from time zero, which is the end of the good times, so for China, it was December. For the rest of the world, it's February. And you can see the rate of new financing by VCs in China went down by 74% in two months. We're seeing this happening in the UK, 30 40% dropped in the first month. And when we look at the recession, this is the blue line. So this line zero is here, November 2007. And you can see how actually it went up and down to so the peak, the most investment done in a month was actually in January 2008, right? Where VCs are flush with cash, they're paid to invest. And when I was talking to Balderton, the largest VC in the UK a few weeks ago, and Planner Perkins and all the other ones, right now they're booming. They see opportunities. The other VCs are, are disabled, are risk averse. They don't invest in the best deals. They keep investing. And that gap usually forms a year later. A year later, Series B dropped by 50%. Series A dropped by 40% or, or so. So this is the future gap, but we have a new gap. We're facing a new, a new shape of contraction that we've never seen before uh, in tech ecosystem and tech financing. And this is this very rapid contraction of VCs, disabled also in their normal processes. I can't meet in person. And when I meet in person, I have a gut feeling about the team. Are they really high ambition? Are you gonna really do it? And suddenly I'm on, I'm on Zoom and I don't have the same emotion. I'm like, maybe, and a, you know, a lot of investors have told me in the past, if I'm at a maybe emotionally after five minutes, I probably will never invest. You know, it's, it's very it's like sensitivity and, and intuition a lot that investors and angels use about the team. So for all of these reasons, we are facing a huge gap in, in financing. And again, when we went back to see you know, is it time to invest? How much does it cost to save a job? And of course, most governments are focused on saving SMEs job and they should, and we encourage that. But when you look at job per job, how much it costs to save a startup job, it's actually 40% cheaper. Because when you start with 500 SME jobs versus 500 tech startups jobs, although 50% of the tech startups will die, and that makes the government say, why should we put money into those that die? Well, the other ones, the five survivors grow so fast that they more than replace those jobs. And three years later, right, this portfolio that we looked at of 2007 Series A startups and said in 2000 and looked 10 years later and five years later, well, three years later, these startups had 645 jobs. So the same 10, 10 startups with a few that died and, and the other ones that grew. So if the government invests in equity and gets normal returns, we saw earlier, 13% average return on the whole portfolio, it would cost them zero, right? They could get 24 million on top of the 18 million they invested. If they have negative returns, then still it costs them less than saving those 500 SME jobs, 9.5 million versus 12 million. And the average wage is higher on the tech jobs. The job multiplier is higher. So you save more indirect jobs, more exports, more for indirect investment. There's a lot of economic argument to say, you know, you need, yes, the tech startup jobs are a very small part of the economy, but you need to save them because they are very important and they are 
a lower cost investment if you do it the right, right. way, if you invest and take equity, 40% cheaper per job. And that's without, of course, calculating all of these other effects. You know, in Israel, they say 9% of the economy is tech, is tech jobs, 9% of the jobs. It's 14% of the GDP. But if you remo remove diamond exports, it's more than 50% of the exports are these these few companies that employ 9% of the people. So very important. I mean, I think this is this is very convincing data about why we need to focus on the startups and why they are important. The only point of difference I would take is that I don't therefore easily leap to that government should create government funds that should invest in startups because that leaves out the management factor. And unfortunately, there are countries where this works very well. Israel, Singapore, you know, there are there are a large number of countries where this has been tried in the past and they don't pick the right people. They pick the right people, but they don't let them do their job. You know, there are lots of we don't want to get into all the nitty gritty. But, you know, I think governments are on safer ground by the way, when not, they try to think of how they the could create picks winner. Right? Yeah, we're not. Talking right. About but it. I think the government's creating the right incentives so that private investors from angels to institutional investors can be incentivized to do more for startups at this time is, is a very good thing to do. And the second thing, which we haven't really talked about yet, is that we have to look at, you know, to what, it, what is the state of the insolvency system in the country? Because it also has to be easier if things go wrong to work things out. And, and a new thing with COVID-19 that I hadn't heard before, and I've been involved in these insolvency regime discussions with the World Bank for some time, is we also have to avoid some well, well-meaning but unintended consequences of some of the laws that were previously put in place to reform insolvency by, which kind of forced uh, owners of companies to go into formal insolvency, when right now there may be so many of those that we will recreate the hospital worry we have in many of our countries with an insolvency tribunal worry, because they're going to have many more cases they can handle. So instead of having these laws be very rigid, you know, seeing what sort of accommodation we could do so that you can encourage informal multiple party settlements that occur out of formal processes, because all this will enable companies to hang in there, that and their, the people that owe them paying them quicker and things like that. Um, you know, we have to do everything we can as governments to give more, you know, more strength and more liquidity to these, uh, to these startups so that they can hang in there longer because many of them don't need to fail. And they will, as you're seeing from this data, they will do well in the long run unless they're pushed into premature insolvencies or premature liquidations from their investors, right? Um, you know, because, because saying, oh, well, we still have the intellectual property, we can start again and do it better. It, it's very expensive to do it that way. And so this is something policymakers need to think about. Um, I know of several promising technology companies now, several that have existed for a number of years with good growth that are really under threat right now. And, and they're not getting any joy from their investors and they're not getting any joy from their governments because they're not a bank and they're, you know, and, and this is dangerous right now. Yeah, dear Matthew, dear JF, thank you very much for all your contributions. We have only 15 minutes to end the session and I want to end it on time. Uh, so uh, Dr. Doné, WBA Business School Director, is going to uh, give closing remarks uh, before uh, closing uh, this session. But I have two announcements. Uh, one of them is uh, WBA Global Startup Committee is making a survey, which you see it my uh, brand. I put the link to chat uh, part. Uh, dear participants, please click the link or copy and paste it and do it later. Please join this uh, survey. We are uh, trying to understand the impact of COVID-19 for uh, startup economy. And the other one is a good and a bad announcement. The uh, good announcement, uh, we will make more um, roundtables, webinars from June on. Uh, global Startup Committee, WBA Business School, Global uh, Women Leaders Committee of WBA, they, they are preparing their own uh, webinars. But uh, from 1st uh, of June, as you know, uh, in all over the world, almost all of the world, economies are opened. So our uh, webinars uh, will be paid uh, after 1st of June. 
for uh, uh, the participants who are coming out of uh, out of WBF community. They will be only uh, be free for high commissioners, senators, international part partners who are uh, now 210 uh, people from 82 countries. But if you want to join and follow these webinars free, then please apply to become an international partner of WBAF. It is a free program, by the way. I put the link of application, then you can follow again uh, free of charge all these uh, uh, great uh, webinars. Uh, it is also in the uh, chat box. So, uh, dear Dr. Paul Donay. You, thank you, thank you. listened, listened uh, to all uh, conversations from the beginning, and let's take a wrap up from you and let's let's uh, have your um, closing remarks. You were the CEO of Turk Telecom until the um, uh, end of the, the last year, uh, where 34,000 people are working and you worked there a very long time. You established the corporate venture department of Turk Telecom, which is uh, one of the biggest uh, corporate venture departments in Turkey. So with your angel investor, corporate venture, professional mindset, how do you make a wrap up of all these conversations? Thank you, brother. Actually, first of all, I'd like to say that um, what, what John has covered, um, this idea of, of customer finance, for example, so uh, is a very interesting idea, especially in the angel investment structure, because what happens exactly as he described that somebody comes with a problem that he can solve and he wants you to participate with uh, in the effort of doing that. And therefore it's a very precise, definitive, uh, perhaps not a very sizable uh, amount of investment and in which hopefully you can contribute with some of your knowledge or opening markets for them or something like that. And I think that the role of an angel investor in that regard comes very much from this type of quote unquote, let me say, the startup of an idea. So generally it is small, it is targeted and it is to serve something existing. Rarely is it uh, to create something totally new. On the other hand, venture capital sometimes, and this now gets closer toward the challenges that we face uh, in relation to what Matt has suggested, for example, uh, we end up with the hype of venture capital people. Uh, why? Because uh, SoftBank is the best example of, of $100 billion. I mean, look at the scale of that money, okay? And then they are hyping up, for example, an asset like WeWork, which obviously doesn't have any of the value that they have uh, hoped it would have or whatever, believe the lie or you know, expanded the lie or whatever it is. But that's very, very serious stuff. And now it's crashed all the way down to a valuation of 2.9, I think, or something like that. And this is a very, very serious issue. So what's happening with these so-called unicorns and big stuff is that they are hyped and they create something like a, a fear of missing out, which really you should be hoping to miss out of this type of stuff. And then, you know, so you have these unicorns. Well, somebody's going to have to invest in them. So let's just forget about them, right? I mean, that's big money, big venture. Uh, soft bank, you know, goes and meets, a, meets somebody and tells him in 15 minutes, 45 minutes, he got $45 billion. Let's forget about that, right? So there are people who will do that. Let's stay away from that, okay? Because that's by definition uh, the best ground for people who hype and lie and are not truthful. And definitely if they make it, good luck to them. So that's perpetuating something which is not factual. Now we come to the SMEs. Now, of course, um, SMEs are are probably one of the most important contributors, not just to jobs, but to the economic activity of a country. And I think what distresses me the most, and I empathize a lot with what we've heard you know, here also from Jaya, and the beauty of the data that you've got there is that decisions should be made on data. And the data that you, that you presented indicates that people who are making these decisions to establish you know, the basis of a policy or what to do should know what that is because the cost of job loss is a cost. And the, the, the cost of supporting a business or a person in, in, in is easily calculatable. Uh, so policymakers can consider these things. The difficulty, I think, you know, personally here, in relation to what we've heard, which is, is a very interesting discussion here, is that, in fact, you know, countries need everything. So you need the angels, uh, and they should be supported in any manner that they possibly can. Uh, you know, by that mean, like tax incentives, when I say that, I I mean, incentives, you don't need 
you know, more than that. And, you know, they know how to gear that thing. And venture capital, okay, venture capital, we have seen that the actual returns on venture capital are hyped. They are not real. I'm sure if JF would present to us the numbers, and I'm sure even Matt has all the numbers, you know, and even private equity, if you look at, uh, you know, let me say total returns over the last 10 years, 10 years, seven years, whatever is their cycle, what is their average annual return? It's not a very high return. Yet it is hyped because of the odd great case. This, this, you know, this company hit great. And by the way, a company that hits great usually lists. And if you love it, just invest in it. Because from the date it lists to the date it, you know, to date is actually is a very big growth. If you love that company, go and invest in it. So there's lots of ways that you can invest uh, without having to take, you know, or let me say following the hype of what these things uh, lead to. The importance of Angel is that it's a human connection. Uh, at a scale where the money is sufficient to get an idea off the ground. This entrepreneurial idea uh, would not be tried otherwise. And you have two people willing to take the risk. By two people, I mean types. The people who want to start it and the people who are going to fund it. And then you've got A and B, and then they start. And then as it builds up, the issue of exit is less relevant because that's what the investor needs to know about the day they actually enter the idea, right? Because if you're giving money to a venture capital fund and they say this is an average seven year, and you know, and then if you think that giving a lot of money to a venture capital fund is gonna give you a superior return, uh, then just go ahead and do it. You see what I mean? Or you, you, you can have someone who will just manage your money in a different form, such as managing illicit entities. But if the point that you mentioned by Bars, the issue is that people want an exit, also, like JF said, in fact, a lot of people just want to know that they're investing in a company that will have a value, and then that value translates into either a dividend yield, which is distribution of profit, or if it gets to an exit, well, so be it. And of course, the, the person that, uh, if you're the angel investor, the first question you're going to ask the guy, are you building this company, uh, you know, are you build it to sell it, or are you building up to run it, build it, and perhaps in the future, maybe, quote unquote, possibly list it if it's not too small, uh, or great, we're gonna make uh, some profit and there's an annual distribution. Then of course you can negotiate certain rights to the funding that you are providing. I don't mean that, but you can have, for example, you know, a preferred uh, preference share type structure, which gives you, since you are putting the money, you can get uh, you know, a bigger part of the, of the early dividends, whatever it is. So you will know that that's, that's your exit, by the way. Otherwise you may as well keep your money in the bank and hope for the best. We all know one thing now in this, uh, COVID environment is that, you know, money in the bank uh, is just going to be what it is, probably even negative. I mean, that's just, if you look at the next five, 10 years, the way things are going to be with this major reset that we have now seen is that, um, you know, getting a, getting a dividend yield out of a listed company seems to me is going to be in the low single digit going forward, you know, where things are. Let's say four or 5% to use something you know, not too depressing. And, and I'm talking about the first world and that translates into emerging markets, things that are closer to eight, nine, let's say generously 10, okay? Now that's the reality of a dividend yield and which is the only measure you can make on a business uh, other than its equity value for an exit. Now, that is a very healthy return, you see. If you keep your money in the bank, basically, uh, we know what that means now, it's basically, uh, you're not going to get much, right? If you want to play the market, you can play the market, and then obviously you can play stocks and bonds, and in, in that area, at least it's a liquid asset. So obviously people mix their portfolio. This is why, actually, there's room for everybody. The SMEs, however, I believe, should need special attention for the reasons that, uh, uh, that Matt and JF also indicated, because they are such an important part of the economy and activity and jobs, and these are real. This is why it's very insulting to me, frankly, when I find that all of a sudden now uh, people are on Zoom and they're saying, great, I can continue working like this. What are you talking about? Okay, the, the, the vast majority of jobs, more than two thirds, 70% of jobs require a manual input and that requires physical presence. It's insulting to this layer of superficial people that say, I can do everything on Zoom, therefore society can function the way I can. Well, if you can function that way, I'm very happy for you, but then don't, uh, you know, extend by implication what other companies need to do. And these jobs, my friends, are very important for these societies. Losing these jobs, if they are not recovered, is a major burden on society. And that in itself 
is going to take us towards a future which will be a lot, a lot tougher. So the contributions that we've heard, which I think are, are, are incredible, you know, from John, Matt, and, uh, uh, and JF, for me, the, the beauty of what you've contributed is you have given a very good indication of what's available and there is backed up by data. So thank you very much for Bybars uh, to, you know, uh, arranging this and thanks to you all for this contribution. It's, it's been a very interesting learning for me. Bye, Bye you're muted. You're muted, brother. Sorry. Uh, no I thanked all of you uh, briefly uh, in my un unmuted uh, time. And um, uh, I have an announcement before uh, closing the uh, session. Uh, please, uh, uh, this announcement is for uh, participants. If you want to join uh, the Glo Global uh, Startup Committee of WBIF, or if you want to join the activities of the Global Women Leaders Committee of WBAF, or if you want to join the WBAF Ethical Governance Committee, please send an email uh, to christina.mcjimsay at wbafforum.org. This email is also in your, in your uh, message, by the way. And uh, I'm very pleased to let you know that the WBAF uh, Ethical uh, Governance uh, Committee under the leadership of Fatih Saab uh, is going to send an email to all participants about our uh, about uh, the committee's uh, declaration uh, on COVID-19 times uh, ethical uh, values. Unfortunately, uh, for example, at least me, I am receiving every day two or three emails from China, from some parts of the world that they want to sell ventilator, masks, etc. Uh, I think I think that, that uh, entrepreneurship uh, under under uh, difficult times uh, should have a different uh, mindset. Uh, so this is what we want to highlight. Uh, we cannot we cannot talk about uh, making profit in in all times. Uh, in some times, entrepreneurs. Uh, should uh, also uh, think more um, uh, uh, more large and uh, think for the uh, future of the world. Uh, so uh, we are going to this committee is going to now uh, declare a um, uh, declaration uh, about the COVID-19 uh, ethical uh, values uh, for for entrepreneurs. Please uh, read about it and share your insights uh, with uh, Fahd Saab and his team. Uh, because we want to make something good uh, for, for the world. Uh, for a startup genome report, I think JF has uh, written the link. Please copy and paste this link and uh, download these reports. Uh, so this, uh, without, without data, without statistics, we cannot have an idea about the future. We cannot talk scientifically. So I'm taking so much uh, to JF uh, for his global efforts. Uh, to make the entrepreneurship ecosystem more scientific. I am taking and so please, much- Please to join us in, in advocating for policy all over the world and use our data. Invite me to a call because it's, it's your past investment also, right? That are at risk. My past investment is an angel unless the government starts helping. Okay, great, great. And I'm also thanking so much to uh, Matthew Jamser because I am in the uh, same board with him. Uh, at the Global Partnership for Financial Inclusion, GPFI Committee uh, of the G20. And uh, I see he is the most, the most active uh, board member of GPFI G20 has ever seen. So uh, I am thanking so much uh, for his really very hardworking. And uh, uh, Matthew, um, uh, financial inclusion is something very important. And this is your uh, uh, this area that you give very importance. There are 2 billion unbanked people in the world. And we, did, we couldn't find time to speak about what will happen to these 2 billion unbanked people while trying to access to health services, et cetera, under uh, COVID-19 uh, times. Uh, so please, uh, dear JF, dear Matthew, dear Dr. Doney, promise me to make another session in July because June is completely full, but another session in July uh, as the uh, episode two uh, of this, of this uh, series, let's say. Uh, 
uh, Donne, Jamser, and Got <laughs> series. Uh, if it is fine, in July, we make another session and we talk also about the importance of financial inclusion um, uh, for, for uh, fostering the world economy. Thank you very much, and let's keep in touch. All the best. Thank you Thank so you. much, Bay Bars. Thank you, Bay Bars. Thank you, Thank you, Thank you buddy, Bay Bars. Thank, Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you, Paul. Bye-bye.